So I'm, now we come to another sutta that I usually read out on retreats, uh, uh, called the Chaitanya Karaniya Sutta, and which means Chaitanya Karaniya to be done by the will is what it means. Uh, making a wish, I don't think it means making a wish, but uh, anyway, that's the translation you find here. Uh, I shall not say who the author of the translation is, but yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's any need to say that. Uh, uh, so not, not, to, not to be done by the will, the Chaitana Akarani, I think is what it is, a sutta. Uh, and Gutra Nikaya, numerical discourses, 10, you see 10 there, chapter 10, 10th uh, uh, Nipata, 10 chapter sutta number 2. Uh, and uh, those of you who have come on these retreats before, you will know the sutta very well because I read out everyone. So I'll go through it fairly fast because I've gone through it so many times. Uh, so sometimes fast, sometimes slow, depending on the circumstances. Uh, so uh, here we go. Mendicants, an ethical person who has fulfilled ethical conduct, <coughs> need not make a wish. May I have no regrets. It is only natural that an ethical person has no regrets. When you have no regrets, you need not make a wish. May I feel joy. It is only natural that joy springs up when you have no regrets. When you feel joy, you need not make a wish. May I experience rapture. It is only natural that rapture arises when you are joyful. When your mind is full of rapture, you need not make a wish. May my body become tranquil. It, <coughs> it is only natural that your body becomes tranquil when your mind is full of rapture. When your body is tranquil, you need not make a wish. May I feel bliss. It is only natural to feel bliss when your body is tranquil. When you feel bliss, you need not make a wish. May my mind be stilled. It is only natural for the mind to be stilled when you feel bliss. When your mind is stilled, you need not make a wish. May I know, truly know and see. It is only natural to truly know and see when your mind is stilled. I use a little bit different translation there, but uh, basically the same idea. So um, that is the basic idea, yeah? And you will see there, again, the nice thing, everything is just really, uh, really interesting. There's samadhi, there's stillness at the very end. There's the samadhi of the mind. There's bliss there. There is uh, uh, tranquility of the body. There is rapture there. There is uh, joy. And there is no regrets. And the whole thing starts out with being ethical. And so, uh, again, and this, what we are seeing here is the experience of meditation, yeah, the internal experience of meditation, what meditation feels like. Yeah. When we looked at the mindfulness of breathing, we're looking a little bit at the kind of mechanics of meditation, not mechanics is the wrong word, the um, kind of what we should look out for, yeah, or what we should do, the breath is included a little bit, uh, so it is more uh, how to use the breath perhaps, uh, but here it is purely psychological. There's no mention of breath. There's no mention of any meditation or breath or anything like that. This is purely first person psychological experience of meditation. So this is the psychology of meditation, if you like. And again, it's all of these amazing qualities. There's nothing negative there. There's no pain. There is no uh, bad qualities of mind. Everything is just super duper positive. Uh, yeah, it makes life sound li really blissful when you read this, uh, these things. Uh. And uh, the whole thing starts off with ethical conduct. Uh. And what is very interesting about this particular sutta is the way that this process or progress is uh, described. You will say, you look, if you see here what it says, it says, need not make a wish. Yeah, you see the, the uh, English there, need not make a wish. And the Pali for that is uh, na chetanaya karaniya, and uh, it does not actually really mean need not make a wish. What it means is not, not to be done through an act of will. That is really what it means. Yeah? This is not to be done through an act of will, which to me is much stronger than need not make a wish. So this is not to be done or cannot be done through an act of will. And uh, so this comes back to this idea that I've been talking about all along, that... Uh, uh, meditation is a natural progress. Uh, it happens uh, yeah, when we get out of the way, 
when we allow things to happen and we don't do anything, that is when meditation happens automatically. Yeah, This is not to be done by an act of will or cannot be done by an act of will. Uh, may I have no regrets. Uh, and then it says, it is natural. It is only natural. Again, it is only natural. Again, I'm not entirely happy with this translation. It is only natural. What it means is that it's dhammata. It is in accordance with nature uh, that an ethical person has no regrets. Uh, and to say it is in accordance with nature is a bit stronger than to say that it's only natural. Uh, so this is a... Uh, this is what happens, yeah? If you have ethical conduct, uh, you won't have any regrets. Uh, and uh, because it is in accordance with nature, uh, because this happens as a matter of cause and effect, uh, if you try to make it happen by an act of will, you get in the way of the cause and effect, yeah? Because the will is not part of the cause and effect. The will is an additional thing. Uh, and by getting in the way, you are destroying the natural progress, uh, it's like taking a little plant, yeah? Take a little plant growing in the garden and thinking the plant doesn't grow, in, grow fast enough. So you want to help the plant a little bit uh, and you start pulling on the plant to make it grow faster. That is not good for a plant, yeah? <laughs> Plants don't need to be pulled. They don't grow faster if you pull them. In fact, it has the exact opposite effect. If you pull the little plant, uh, you destroy the plant. Uh, and in exactly the same way as you destroy the plant when you pull on it, uh, you destroy the meditation when you pull on the meditation through willpower or whatever you may, uh, whatever you may do at that particular time. Uh, yeah, so please don't pull on the meditation. Uh, pulling on meditation is a bad idea. So uh, please don't do that. Uh, you promise? Yeah. yeah? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, that's excellent. Uh, I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, and then as you stop pulling on the meditation, yeah, then this process starts to happen. Uh, yeah, when you have no regrets, in other words, this is the power of sila, then it is natural to feel joy. Joy just arises as a consequence of that. Uh, yeah? So, uh, in other, and again, what that means is that we don't really have to do a lot of sila, nusati, the contemplation of sila. We don't have to try very hard. Usually, there's a natural joy that arises because you feel good about yourself. Yeah, You know that you're living well. You know you're doing the right thing. And because that joy just comes, you just think, yay, okay, I'm doing, doing well, living in the right way, doing good things. And so the joy kind of arises. You don't have to try very hard. And then, stage by stage, the meditation just happens. Why? Because you stand back, because you allow it to happen, you allow the process to happen. That is what this uh, sutta really is about, uh, this idea of no will, no intention is required. Uh, allow the process to happen. Uh, and uh, there's something very beautiful about this. Uh, you know, we spend our life very hard trying to kind of get our act together, trying to make things happen. Uh, everything we do in the world is about ambition and willpower and doing things and trying and being creative. Uh, and uh, almost everything in the world is about uh, using the will to make the world uh, fall into place in accordance with our desires and our wishes. Uh, and it's actually very tiring. Yeah? Always using the willpower, always doing things. After a while, you get fed up. Yeah? You get all this tiredness all the time. Uh, and uh, so uh, this then is the opposite. Yeah, finally, you can just really relax. Finally, you have to do the exact opposite of what you normally do. No more doing, no more willpower, no more trying, just allowing things to be. And the very act of allowing things to be makes things happen. That is what makes things happen. It's the opposite of things in the world. Real happiness doesn't come from action. Real happiness doesn't come from making the happiness happen. Real happiness comes from letting things be here, allowing the joy to rise by itself. There's something extremely attractive about that. Yeah? No more tiring yourself out. No more trying very hard. Instead, just enjoying the ride, sitting on the train, enjoying the scenery, enjoying the ride as you go along. That is all you have to do. And... Uh, yeah, so that is kind of the, uh, the idea behind this. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Mm. I always thought that when uh, Ajahn Brahm taught meditation, Ajahn Brahm always taught meditation in a very simple way. You just sit down, you relax, uh, you don't do anything, you just allow everything to happen, yeah? 
And so I would go to her and say, ah, it's not happening to me. Why is it not happening? You were telling me this was supposed to happen. What's going on there? <laughs> and Ajahn Brahm said, sit longer, exactly. <laughs> that would be his one kind of piece where I sit longer. We haven't sat long enough yet. Uh, and if you look at this particular uh, sutta, it kind of makes sense. It fits with this idea. Yeah, It's not that you have anything to do. It's just that you have to allow the process to unfold. Uh, and the longer you sit, the more likely it is to unfold. Uh, but there is one problem. What if it doesn't work? What if you sit and sit and sit and you've got pain here and pain there? And, oh, I just took a boy. What am I supposed to do? And so why doesn't it sometimes work? And the answer, of course, is that when you're dealing with an automatic process like this, one thing automatically leading to the next one, you have to go to the beginning of the process. And that is where you find out why it doesn't work. And the beginning of this process is ethical conduct. Yeah, This is the critical thing here. And so if the process isn't really working for you, it means that your ethical conduct may not be as pure as it may be it should be. And that doesn't mean you are a bad person. I'm not trying to say that anyone here is a bad person. In fact, everyone here is obviously a good person, because otherwise you wouldn't be here. But the point is rather that the bar for ethical conduct is very high. It's a very, very high bar. And it's very difficult to clear that bar. That is the real reason that. Yeah, so when we talk about ethical conduct in Buddhism, we talk about uh, positive conduct. We talk about the idea of kindness. Uh, and we talk about the idea of kindness in thought. Metta, karuna. How much metta and karuna do we have? Uh, do we always think about people in a positive way? Uh, yeah, do we have a sense of compassion, understanding that when people do bad things, uh, actually they are trapped in a certain way. So we have karuna for them. And this is the critical thing. And if you're able to develop those kind of mental qualities where you always have either metta or karuna, and this is what we should have for everyone in the world, no one in the world should be excluded from those two qualities regardless of who they are, regardless of what they have done. We should try to include everyone in those uh, two categories. Uh, well, then uh, things will fall into place. Uh, yeah? Then the meditation will really work, uh, especially if you have a bit of time just to relax and to let things be and you're not tired out. Uh, then that process will happen as a consequence. Uh, so this is really where it starts out. Yeah? Be more, uh, try to be even more ethical if you can. Uh, bring this to an entirely new level, uh, a new kind of uh, reality, a level that you have never experienced before. Uh, uh, and then uh, these things come together. Uh, be more generous. Uh, in kind of daily little things, yeah, all the time around you. Generosity is, is, in a sense, metta in action because you're kind to the people around you on a regular basis all the time. Eh? Then these things will happen as a consequence. Eh? So this is this little sutta, which is so simple, yeah, and uh, yet so profound in so many ways. Eh? So uh, ethical conduct. And so let's just have a quick look at the rest of the sutta as well. So you go through all of these things, yeah, and experience all of the joys and the uh, rapture and the uh, tranquility and then the bliss and then the samadhi down here, the stillness. And then from the samadhi, you know and see things truly. Uh, this is Yata Buddha Nanadasana, knowledge and vision according to reality. And then let's go to the very end uh, when you truly know and see, you need not make a wish, or you, uh, uh, you, you cannot do this by an act of will. May I become disillusioned and dispassioned? It is accordance with nature that you become dis disillusioned and dispassioned when you know and see. This just means that when you truly know and see, what you see is dukkha, and so you let go. That's what this means, basically. When you're disillusioned and dispassionate, you need not make a wish, or you... This is not to be done by an act of will. May I realize knowledge and vision of freedom. It is according to nature that you realize knowledge and vision of freedom when you are uh, disillusioned and dispassionate. Uh, and so, mendicants, the knowledge and vision of freedom is the purpose and benefit of disillusionment, uh, etc., etc. Each one is the purpose and knowledge uh, of, of the preceding quality, all the way back to uh, the very first one. And then it says, and so mendicants, good qualities flow on and fill up one to the other for going from the near shore to the far shore. So by doing this, you go from the near shore to the far shore, allowing things to build up in this way. 
So that is a brief summary of that sutta. And uh, just to give you an idea of this uh, simple ideas of things just happening in accordance with nature. And so much of the Buddhist path is about allowing nature to take its course, uh, setting, in, setting in place the uh, uh, basic qualities, uh, yeah, the foundational qualities, uh, and then the rest happening as a matter of course. So. Let's look at one more sutta, just to really tire you out today, just to kind of maximize. <laughs> so um, we're going to look at the Atama Upanisa Sutta. And uh, so the vital conditions, Upanisa is here translated as a vital condi condition, huh? um, and uh, sometimes also called the proximate condition, huh? but here a vital condition. So uh, this is another one who kind of drives home exactly the same point that we have been looking at just now, huh? but in a slightly different way, yeah? slightly, different, uh, slightly different angle. Uh, the uh, sequence of phenomena is actually the, exactly the same here. It starts off with, uh, uh, with um, uh, virtue, morality, uh, yeah, ethics, and then it goes all the way to uh, seeing things according to samadhi, seeing things according to reality, and then the very end of the path after that. Uh. So uh, again, yeah, mendicants, an unethical person who lacks ethic, uh, Ethics has destroyed the vital condition for having no regrets. When there are regrets, one who has regrets has destroyed a vital condition for joy. And all the way up to the end, yeah, and this means you also have destroyed the vital condition for samadhi. It's in there. And for seeing things according to reality. And then ultimately destroyed the vital condition for knowledge and vision of freedom. Yeah. So... Yeah, so this is, a, again, this idea of vital conditions gives a different angle. Right? The last one was about you cannot make it happen. It happens, happens according to nature. But here we're looking at it from the point of view of vital conditions. So if you are not an ethical person, and if you haven't kind of made that ethics a very central part of your life, then the conditions for samadhi is destroyed. Yeah, samadhi becomes impossible, basically, at that particular point. So... Um, this shows you how important ethics is at the very beginning of this. And once you have that ethics in place, well, then the process just happens. And samadhi comes as a natural consequence of that ethics that you have. It's a vital condition. Yeah? It's a very strong kind of term right there. And in this case, in this particular sutta, not just does it say samadhi, it says samma samadhi. Samma samadhi, of course, is the four jhanas on the noble eightfold path. So for that reason, very... Very significant. Uh, so, um, yeah, so vital conditionality is another way of thinking about this. Uh, so then it says, uh, suppose there was a tree that lacked branches and foliage. Uh, its shoots and softwood and hardwood would not grow to fullness. Yeah? So what is the point here? The point here is that uh, the hardwood is the insight, yeah? seeing things according to reality. Yeah? The softwood can maybe be understood as the samadhi. Yeah? Yeah? The uh, shoots and barks are maybe the, uh, the, the joy that you experience before samadhi. Yeah? These are the core things that we're trying to reach. Now, if you don't uh, have branches and foliage, uh, there is no way that these other things are going to happen. You've got to have the branches and foliage. It nourishes uh, the rest of the tree. Uh, it nourishes the hardwood. It nourishes the softwood. Uh, in the same way, if you haven't got ethics, uh, there's nothing there to nourish the core aspects of the path. The samadhi, the insight, the joy. There's no nourishment for the joy. Uh, and so you need to have those things to make the core of the spiritual life grow. It grows based on these uh, uh, simple things, uh, ethics, kindness, generosity, uh, faith, and home, uh, confidence in the triple gem. All of these things are the foliage and branches of the tree. Uh, so make sure you look after the foliage and the branches. Uh, and if you allow the sun to shine on the foliage and the branches, uh, yeah, if you like the true, allow the true Dhamma 
to soak into your very being, listening to the Saddamma, the true teachings, hanging out with the Saparisas, the great people in the world, then you are nourishing the foliage and the branches of the tree. And then gradually, heartwood itself comes to growth and to fulfillment. And one day you are, no, I shouldn't say that. I was going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> we are like banana trees. We don't have a proper core, but that, that's not quite right either. But it's, it is true in one sense. Anyway, forget about that. That's a, that's a complete uh, side issue. It doesn't really doesn't work. Yeah. And in the same way, an ethical person who has fulfilled ethics have fulfilled the, the vital condition, not a vital condition, I say, for having no regrets. Uh, when there are no regrets, one who has no regrets has fulfilled the vital condition for joy, which fulfills the vital condition for rapture, which fulfills the vital condition for tranquility, which fulfills the vital condition for bliss, which fulfills the vital condition for samadhi, which fulfills the vital condition for seeing things in accordance with reality, which fulfills the vital condition for disillusionment and dispassion. And one who has fulfilled disillusionment and dispassionment has fulfilled the vital condition for knowledge and vision of freedom. Suppose there was a tree that was complete with branches and foliage. Its shoots, bark, and softwood and heartwood would grow to fullness. So there you are. That is what happens uh, when you get the foundations of the path in place. Uh, so, um, let's have another break. Let's have some tea and coffee. Uh, and we'll see you back again at uh, 4.30.